Well, thanks so much, Julie. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, particularly to follow Greg, who always uh, gives uh, an enormous boost to uh, any presentation that follows him because, uh, thank you, because uh, it's so much easier to explain what's going on. My task is just to present a, a, a brief case um, of something that can happen when you close a PFO, uh, fortunately not very often, or an ASD for that matter, which is probably a little bit more common. This is a case, and the only case I've had of uh, this particular complication. I thought I'd flesh it out a little bit, just discussing PFOs again. Um, Greg has done a lot of the hard work for me, but this is a, this is a post-mortem uh, specimen of someone who didn't survive their paradoxical thromboembolism, and this is something you really don't see, you hope you don't see very often at all. Greg has shown a very nice echo image of this sort of thing, which is a big clot straddling a PFO, uh, and that ended up in this patient's brain causing a stroke. Um, you've seen uh, bubble contrast studies, but just by way of definition, we talk about relatively simple PFOs where the septum is not uh, particularly mobile, like this one, and uh, this one, which is a much more floppy, much more mobile septum as being a, a septal aneurysm. And, Traditionally, until recently, um, neurologists were very keen that we close the septal aneurysms with a, with a shunt, but less convinced about uh, closing the simple PFOs. But there are now data presented in the last couple of years from three big randomised trials uh, published in the New England Journal about two years ago, showing that if you have a PFO and a shunt, uh, whether you've got a septal aneurysm or not, uh, it should be closed in a, in a young person these still are thought to have a higher prep, uh, likelihood of a further uh, event. Now, just to flesh that out again, in terms of procedures, we try to identify th uh, the type of uh, PFO according to one of these three classifications. Type 1 is a simple, very simple PFO where you've just got a flat uh, septum primum against the septum secundum. It doesn't really lift off at all, so there's quite a long tunnel. The type 2 lifts off the septum primum, but still has a reasonable tunnel length. And then the type 3 lifts off com almost completely, so that it really only touches the septum secundum uh, in, um, so at the end of uh, deep breath or valsalva. Now, these can be difficult just on your, certainly not on your transthoracic echo, even on a simple uh, trans uh, esophageal echo, it may not be all that easy to distinguish between these two. Sometimes you really do need a big breath hold or a big valsalva to get it to actually lift off. This has some implications for the choice of devices which we'll go through. You can make these very simple um, and uh, we've tended to evolve to a procedure that doesn't require any imaging at all, doesn't require a transesophageal probe, it doesn't require an anaesthetic, it's a 10 minute local anaesthetic procedure. Um, but if you, if you uh, live in the United States, they tend to make this a very complex procedure and do all sorts of measurements of the tunnel length and the size and balloon sizing it and general anaesthetics and uh, I think that's really not necessary. But you can describe the PFO in a lot of different ways. By and large, uh, here in Australia, certainly in our, my institution, we have evolved to a simple procedure using uh, just the one device. There are a number of those disc devices that, uh, that Greg has uh, described, not only the Amplatzes, but others that look somewhat different, some that look the same. And there's a series of other devices I will touch on. In trying to decide which device to use, there are a number of considerations. These are potential complications. We know that the device itself can be thrombogenic and you can end up having clot form on the device and cause a stroke. We worry about uh, the risk of erosion, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. The risk of the device falling out is real if you've got a very mobile atrial septum, it can embolize. And we worry also about the potential for the devices themselves to cause atrial fibrillation. More and more we're starting to worry a little bit about access to the left atrium. If you put a big uh, uh, device across the uh, atrial septum, it may be that it then becomes impossible to get to the left atrium for other interventions. This is the device you've seen already. I won't go through it in any detail. There are a number of device sizes. The most common, I'd say about 80% of the ones we use are this 18 millimeter disc on the left atrial side, 25 on the right atrial side. 
But it's important to remember there is a smaller disk for the very simple type of PFOs. It's worth considering using the smaller disk. And for some of the really big and complex septal aneurysms, you do need to consider using the, the larger 35 millimeter device. The case that I was asked to present uh, is this one. This is a lady who's 58 years old. She presented uh, some years ago with the right middle cerebral artery stroke and was found to have a fairly simple PFO. She was treated with a 25 millimeter device and did well for a period of about 18 months, but then presented with breathlessness, lethargy and was hypotensive. Her initial echo showed a, a, about a 16 millimeter pericardial effusion and she had echo features and clinical features of tamponade. So the, uh, perfusion, the effusion was tapped, 300 mils of blood stain fluid was drained, but after the uh, pigtail was taken out, the fluid reaccumulated. So she went on to have surgery and it was clear at surgery that the device had ruptured both anteriorly and posteriorly and uh, through the atrial wall so that it was necessary to remove the device and to place a, a bovine pericardial patch. So this is the only one that we've seen. Fortunately, it is a rare complication, particularly of PFO closure. It's perhaps more common with ASD closure where the device really does sometimes splay across the, uh, the, <coughs> the, coronary, the um, aortic sinus. If you look through the literature, there are, there's a handful of case reports. And we, this one was, was published by actually some of Greg's colleagues up in Brisbane where she presented. But the incidence is thought to be only about one in a thousand or so, uh, all up for ASDs and PFOs. The risk factors that have been described are oversizing the device. If you have a deficient rim on the superior, superior anterior aspect, Thought to be more common with the rigid nitinol devices, such as the Amplatzer device that we do use. And when the device is very mobile, it's thought perhaps that might cause additional uh, erosion uh, due to friction with the surrounding structures. Based on uh, this thought, we had uh, some years ago toyed with the idea of trying to develop a smaller device that uh, was less likely to cause an erosion. This is the Coherix flat stent. It's a device that can be placed just within the tunnel. So there is nothing much on either the left atrial or right atrial side, and it certainly doesn't interfere with any aspect of the aorta. If you look at the device uh, from the, these are the pig studies, but you can see on, from the right atrial side, you see almost no device. Left atrial side, you see a little bit of scarring. So this was a device thought to be, um, to minimize the risk of erosions. The trouble is it's, um, again, if you look at these device, uh, the scepter, it's suitable for patients who have a long tunnel, less so for a short tunnel, and certainly not for the type three where it lifts up completely. We found that we've spent a long time trying to determine whether or not the, set, the PFI was suitable for this device, and based on that, it really didn't proceed <coughs> as it was never commercialized. There is one other device that is being used currently in Europe. It has CE mark approval, but hasn't made it here yet. That perhaps is worth considering um, as a way of minimizing risk of some of these complications. This is like a perclose or per uh, proglide that you use to uh, suture the uh, PFO closed. Uh, it's a 4 poly polypropylene suture. Uh, it's quite a complex looking system done with a bit of contrast rather than TEE. Transesophageal echo, um, but there are certainly centres that have quite good experience with this, good closure rates, and the, when you look at it, there should be a minimal risk of erosion or embolisation or endocarditis or any of the other things which fortunately are all pretty rare with this device. I won't go through that, but it's called the noble, noble stitch and we'll probably see that at some point in the near future. <coughs> The other approach that has been used that really hasn't been developed, hasn't gone anywhere, is to try to use a device that will uh, 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 bio-reabsorb, so you end up with virtually nothing left in the septum. Um, this is a, a device that is made from collagen matrix that resorbs, uh, and all you left behind is a few of these little struts. Again, this was tried for a while. They had some problems with strut fractures and hasn't really reached commercialization yet. So I think 
the important thing, we get a little blasé with some of these procedures and tend to put uh, PFO closure devices in, in young people who are going to have them for a long time. There is always an important consideration that uh, you can cause complications. Fortunately, they are rare. Particularly with the Amplatzer device, we really don't see a lot. It has the best record in, uh, in the published trials. We don't see a lot of atrial arrhythmias. Uh, we do see the very rare um, co uh, complication of an erosion. And I think there is still some argument for considering small f footprint devices or bioresorbable devices if they're available. Thanks very much. Thank you.